everybody. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am Jessica Henry Gray and I'm really happy to have you back with me this week. Um, today I'm going to do a still life. Now I like to kind of mix it up on my channel and so typically while I do plein airs or portraits, still lifes you can learn so much from and this beautiful holiday season upon us right now I decided to do something a little bit festive. I've got this gorgeous pomegranate right behind me and some evergreen and some cedar branches and a glass of uh, red wine. And so I am going to demonstrate how to paint this beautiful holiday still life. And I hope that you guys enjoy this video and be sure to like and subscribe and be sure to check out the links below. I have a still life workshop coming up in January of 2021 and a whole bunch of other workshops too, which I'm going to be telling you about as we go along here. So I think you're going to enjoy this one and I will see you on the other side. All right. Let's get going. Welcome today to Still Life Painting. Still Lifes are appreciated for their unique beauty and their sense of timeless quality. I love painting Still Lifes because it's always a new challenge in capturing the movement of light. Um, there is always the fun of painting new and different things. But what I truly love is to capture emotion and mystery and um, just playing with those different elements in a still life painting. Still life paintings can be narrative. Um, they tell a story or relay some event. They can be complicated with all kinds of different elements in it, um, concentrating on composition and design. They can also be very simple too, and just a matter of placing a few objects next to each other and allow the beauty of the subject to just really be what the painting is all about. Today I want to show you a painting that I've put together um, of a pomegranate. I'm going to demonstrate how to paint a pomegranate and a glass of wine and some evergreen branches and I really want just want to show you this but at the same time I want to take you on a journey of why still life painting is important to everything else that we're going to be studying. To learn more about setting up a still life, join my workshop I have in January 2021. Uh, for today, I'm going to be using um, some new colors, just one or two new colors. Titanium white, cadmium yellow medium, cadmium red light, and cadmium red medium. Yellow ochre, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, and a little bit of phthalo green. So the cadmium reds are new to my typical palette. I have a little bit of linseed oil in my palette cups and I am getting going. I have an 11 by 14 gessoed masonite panel and I'm beginning with a thin wash of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue with a little bit of odorless mineral spirits. Put it on quickly and wipe it off. Now I take, um, this is a size 4 flat brush and I'm just doing a thin mixture of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. And to the right you see my still life and um, I begin by making indications on my canvas of the height of my still life and the width. I want to know exactly where the main objects are going to fit inside my canvas. So that is my first rule of composition. Where are my objects going to sit in the canvas? Now that applies to anything you are studying. If you're a plenary painter, a portrait artist, or you're working on um, just a commissioned project on a, from a photo, you have to first establish where it's going to live within the boundaries of your 11 by 14 or whatever your canvas size is that you're working on. So I establish the height and the width. Within those confines, then, I can better gauge how big things are going to be. <clears throat> so my wine glass will be the tallest object in the painting. And if that's the tallest to the top and then off to the right is the width, I know that within those boundaries, they're only going to be so large. So I begin very loosely um, with my brush, just sketching out where all of these are going to sit as they relate to each other, given their, their sizes as I've indicated. So the wine glass and the pomegranates are all roughly the same size. So I'm making the wine glass just a little bit smaller than the pomegranates. You have to be willing to be adaptable as you're painting to make the composition work on your canvas despite what you see in front of you. You can take a lot of time and make your arrangement perfect and that's one way to do it. Um, if there is one element or two elements to your still life that just need a little bit of tweaking, you are free to do that onto your canvas because ultimately your canvas is what's going to last. Um, all right, so when I have things roughly laid out, I can begin 
um, just refining my drawing a little bit more. And one thing I love about uh, taking the brush and thinner is that I'm free to wipe it out quickly if I need to, as opposed to drawing it on with the pencil. Pencil you have to erase and you got ink, pencil smudges and lead and whatever else mixing with your paint. Um, this is already, because I'm using the brush, I'm mentally getting in the painting game. I'm thinking about sculpting mass, dimension, form, volume. Um, I'm pretty much all saying the same thing, but with a pencil, you're thinking linear, two-dimensional. Um, you're, th you're not really into the sculpting mindset with a pencil. With a brush, you're already there. So from step one, right out of the gate, I'm thinking painting and sculpting. Um, so I'm taking a little bit of alizarin crimson into my ultramarine blue sienna mixture to start getting the darkest values laid in first. Um, now because my subjects are right front and center, I want to establish where the, I'm going to go first with the value extremes on those objects as first. The background obviously is black and that's um, pretty much as dark as it's going to go. I don't like to, I've never used just straight black. Uh, very rarely, and I've seen other artists who do, and it's beautiful, but if I were to just use flat black with this background, it would have a dead, empty quality. So I use ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, and it gives just a little bit more vitality to my um, values that are considered black. So this wine, it looks black, but I added a little bit more alizarin crimson to it to give it a sense of redness. As I go along here, and I'm establishing the um, values around the evergreens and the pomegranates. Uh, I'm, I'm gauging whether they're slightly more bluish, slightly more reddish, um, just to give a little bit of differentiation to the darkest values. And then I'm establishing where the values are going to go as they extend over to the edge of the canvas. So around that back pomegranate, uh, there's a dark value. And I'm seeing as that extends over to the edge, what that corner is going to be like with the amount of value I have back there. Um, and then of course I do the same thing to the front of the wine glass and um, I pretty much fast forward the areas where I'm working on just the flat background because some paintings I do enjoy spending a lot of time um, on the background. This one there wasn't much to say or do especially since I wanted to keep the focus right in the foreground. So that's pretty quiet. Um, as I'm working I'm conscious of edges and I'm thinking about how the edges of this wine glass and the um, objects in the front and the evergreen, the cedar branches behind it, how they're all going to just play together. So I'm sort of working on them all at the same time and I want to get those in play and you'll see as I'm going here I jump back and forth between a dark green and a dark red and then the flat, the darker background color. Um, and the purpose for that is to so that I can concentrate on the edges as I'm working along. Um, this method of painting in one sitting is called a la prima, which, which means in one sitting. And I like to do this for my still lifes as well, if it's a fairly simple setup, because it gets my head in that mindset when I go out and do plein air painting. Um, I first started doing still life painting when I was a teenager, and that's what I focused on for probably 20 years, still lifes, portraits, just studio work. And then um, I didn't really introduce plein air until uh, I was, um, I don't know, in my 20s. And um, that, that changed things for me when I realized that plein air painting is really just the same as doing a still life. You have your background, <clears throat> you have your objects in the foreground, and then you have, um, you know, your foreground as it comes out at you, the table surface, which is the ground. And so when I had that aha moment that um, still lifes prepared me for plein air painting, everything started clicking easier with plein air painting. Um, and then of course it works the same with portraiture. The more you can really develop your finesse and your understanding of still life painting, the better you'll get at portraiture. You're dealing with all the same factors. You have form, value, edges, colors. Uh, the beauty of a still life though is it holds still. <laughs> it is not moving on you. It is, you're not dealing with changing light, um, bugs or wind, um, or your model being late or whatever the case. So I definitely encourage people uh, to always begin with still life. And then what you find, the more you work on still lifes, the more fun you have with them. Um, there's always a new challenge to uncover and a new adventure. You know, what happens if I paint these cedar branches 
as they just disappear into a mysterious inky black ground of, of just black? Um, or how can I make this wine glass look evocative with just a few sparkles of light? Um, and, and so there's always these new challenges, painting smoke rising up from a pipe or um, steam from a teacup. And uh, I, I love those challenges. So once you start getting into the joys of still life painting, it's, it just becomes sort of an intoxicating challenge. You, like, you want more. And uh, that's what I really loved about this one as I was working on it, the challenge of that mysterious green um, just emerging from the shadows that I just loved doing that. And then this uh, pomegranate, as some of it's in shade, you, as I'm working on here, a little bit of um, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, some white, and then um, just allowing the the sculptural feeling of that pomegranate to come al alive on the canvas was a, a joy and a challenge. Um, squinting down at it simplified all the form, and yet suddenly you don't see all the complex little nuances of the inside a pomegranate. You see the masses, and so that's what I want to focus on here as I'm blocking in the main shapes of it. Um, instead of looking for all the curves in whatever you're painting, always break it down to the angles, even if they're small angles. I do this on portraiture or painting a tree. Um, curves have a way of weakening something, but look for the angles and it will suddenly appear, appear stronger. So as I'm blocking in the shape of this pomegranate and the pieces of the, um, the wedges that come at me, that's what I'm looking at, those angles, and they're just abstract shapes. That's how I deal with any sort of foreshortening um, situations on anything, an arm, a hand as it's coming out at me. Just look for those strange abstract shapes. All right, now um, as I'm working on the pomegranate, I'm blocking in the, the main value color masses, the color of the seed blocks, the color of the light blocks and the shadow blocks. And some of the values in the red berries are a little bit darker, so I add a little bit more alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue. Um, some of them get a little bit lighter, so I'll add a little bit more of the cadmium reds, red light, red medium, to my alizarin crimson. And you'll see it kind of gives it more of a red wine color to the pomegranate seeds. All right, now I'm beginning the pomegranate in the background, and I'm taking a little bit more of the cadmium red light into my alizarin crimson mixture, and I'm painting the, uh, the sort of the darker layer of the skin on that pomegranate. I've already painted the shadow in place, and so I'm putting just that lighter red skin over the surface of the pomegranate. Over that, I will put a little bit more of an intense reddish light red over that, um, just as needed, but I wanted the base of that first to have that in place. Even at this point of blocking in the colors, I'm concentrating on the edges as color mass meets color mass or value mass, looking at the still life um, and then just evaluating which edges are soft. Wherever I can lose an edge to a background or soften an edge where a color mass meets another color mass, I will um, definitely lose it there and maybe push the boundaries a little bit too. The little bit of a shine on the shadow, um, very blue, coolish tone, um, very important to that part of it, uh, of the pomegranate. And then um, as I'm going along also, I'm, I'm paying attention to warm and cool uh, variables throughout the painting. And whatever it is you're painting, whether a landscape or a portrait, you are always confronted with the issue of warm and cool. And what exactly does that mean? Whatever your light is, your shadow's going to be the opposite. 
so if your light is very warm, as in the case of this um, still life, the light is a warm light. So all of my lit areas are going to have a warmth uh, to the color uh, quality. And then the shadows are going to be very blue and cool. A lot of times in landscape painting, that's the same way. Warm sunlight, cool shadows. Um, same with portraiture. So uh, whatever it is, that's just a rule. It has to, one has to be the opposite of the other. Um, the better you get at understanding warm and cool relationships, the stronger your paintings will be. So that is something to just really become a student of. Um, now I'm laying down a cooler base for the foreground as the shadows behind the fruit come around to the front and are under the fruit. It's a little bit cooler, but where the light is directly hitting the hot spot on the table, I make much warmer. All right, now I'm coming up into the pomegranate and I'm putting the shadow back on it, uh, like on the shadow side of the inside of the fruit that is sort of a warm gray, um, just as the light is filtering through the membranes. Um, sort of a yellow ochre, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, little white. There's only so many colors you have to pick from, but you, it's how much of those colors that makes all the difference. And these are all things that I'm going to be discussing in further depth in my still life workshop in January. Um, it's so important to have a firm grasp on these, even if you're not a huge fan of still lifes. Um, if you really just ever only want to paint plein air, uh, really, truly, I encourage you to master still lifes and uh, portraiture. Everything that you work on will get better by learning to paint from life in a controlled environment. Um, all right, so back to this. I'm getting a little bit of a yellow ochre and white to get some of that membrane waxy feeling to the inside of the pomegranate. As you see, I already blocked in the, the masses where the berries are going to go, and then this membrane uh, parts of the inside of the pomegranate, I'm carving out and around the other, the berries and different things inside the pomegranate. I'm using a little bit more of that cadmium red medium into the yellow ochre and white mixture to get some of that more coral shade of red. And often we look at a piece of fruit, or in this case, this pomegranate in the light, and we think, oh, it's red. But when the light is hitting it, it's not quite red red. It's not like you don't make pink um, to make it look light. White will cool things down. And if I want a warm light, hitting a red object, you can't just mix white with it because it'll turn it pasty pink. Um, so a little bit of the cadmium red is still warm. A little bit of yellow ochre is sort of opaque. So together they lighten it and the little bit, smallest touch of white will then just lighten it. And so that's one way that you can deal with uh, colors that are warm. Um, instead of adding white to cool it down, you, you can lighten it by using other colors. All right, so coming back in and around the pomegranate, I'm just um, giving a little bit more finesse to the different shapes and values as I've been concentrating on the parts of it that are open. Now on that note, a little cadmium yellow, yellow ochre, and ultramarine blue gives me more of that lit, warm lit effect for the green as the light comes around and these um, cedar branches sort of wrap around the lit pomegranate. Now again, not to add white to the green to lighten it, I add the cadmium yellow to lighten that green and it gives it more of that warm light effect that I'm looking for because in order to create the illusion that the light is warm and the um, cedar and the pomegranate are all in a nice warm hot spot I have to add that cad yellow to make it happen. Now to continue that movement of light in that cedar branch the background is very blue. You can see I added a lot more blue and yellow ochre to the branch as it slips into shadow and I'm blocking in this mass of cedar, loosely getting the shape. I'm not worried about all the little twiggy, um, knobbly things on the branch. 
but I'm just squinting and getting the mass. As I start to put in more of the background, I will carve the blackness around the green to sort of develop that shape. But I want a lot of those edges completely lost. And then of course, as it comes around at the front, I have a sharper, crisper effect on the branches as they're in the light. All right, now, so this is what I was referring to, the dark background. It's just ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. And then as I bring it around the branch, I'm then carving away the green to develop more of that cedar effect. Um, just using, and this is a size six flat. And into the wine glass, not worried about the glass at this point. I'm just painting what I see beyond the glass. And just coming around, getting all of those. I want my shadows to feel connected. And so that's um, that passage where I need the dark of the wine glass, the dark wine, the dark of the pomegranate, they have this wonderful sense of connectedness. And then behind that little pine branch over there, that's all sort of connected and those dark um, shadows sort of frame that whole, the, the light area. And that's what I have going on in the corner of this canvas as well. Again, that darker mass just framing that whole lit area. So I'm painting the foreground and again it's it, same thing with painting landscapes whenever you're painting something that you want to look like a flat surface whether it's a meadow um, or in this case a table surface I use horizontal brush strokes your brush strokes are always going to define form so I want uh, just a nice flat area and then I think about it as it recedes back under the objects and um, so I'm using a little bit darker accent in and around things there too all right so back to the glass um, that wherever I can lose an edge, that's what I'm working on. I just have a nice dark mixture and I'm looking at my glass to see where those edges are completely lost and where some are found. Bringing the dark um, blue-brown right next to the dark alizarin will just give a subtle uh, difference there. Um, and then I'm going to mix a little bit of a slightly different lighter value as the roundness of the glass comes around. Um, and, um, just refining the shape too. This is a little bit more of the alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue. I wanted uh, the shape, I brought the green leaves up to the glass, but not all the way. So I'm taking the glass wine color down to the leaves now of the evergreen and just softening everything there. Because I want, even though I look at my wine glass, I can see a sharp crisp edge, but to convey the feeling of roundness, you have to soften the edge. A um, little bit of light blue um, with a little bit of the burnt sienna to tone it down. On that side, I noticed it was just a little bit warmer, less blue, and tried to get it in one swipe. Um, when I looked at the wine glass, I could see it was just slightly, um, just a little off, and then fuzzy, softer, velvety uh, effect to the glass. I do that part of the painting of any glass first. Whatever is the background color I paint first then whatever on the shines is softer more muted quieter I paint those and the very last thing I do is add the sparkles so soft round edges and I'm sorry my camera is not directly in front of my canvas it looks a little bit wonky um, but anyway so the pomegranate is reflected up in the bottom of the glass so I get a little bit of that in there a little shine from the pomegranate right there and then, um, of course, I'm not done with the glass, but as you build up in layers, um, I'm gonna work on just softening edges as I go of all these shines. I don't want any of them standing out too bright until I do the shines.
Another thing I can do to soften the edges is just take a fan brush and I mean it is just the feather lightest touch but I lose some of the sharp brush strokes of those passages where I really want the glass just to sort of have that round form. So those those subtle shifts in the values are, are just very delicately handled. Now the shines on the glass that is a little yellow ochre and white and I try to just do it in one touch in a few places. I don't put as many shines and sparkles as I see on the glass because you don't need all those. Only do the ones that you feel are going to best convey and tell the story. Um, I added a few and then I stop and I look and I think do I need more? Maybe just a few more and that's really all I go for. There's a few down at the base of the glass that I, I think are important. And you couldn't see that um, cadmium red dot in the in the wine but I've painted enough glasses of wine to know that sometimes the light shines through the liquid and adds a little red sparkle at the base and so I wanted to put that in um, all right so a little bit of whatever's happening on the table is bounced up into the bottom part of the wine glass and I felt some of that was important so I put some of it in on the other side of the stem it's picking up the red from the pomegranate and then on the shadowed side of the stem, it's getting um, sort of the reverse. So there's a darkness on that side of the stem. So again, the painting still lifes is all about the power of observation. And the better you get at seeing these little nuances, the more realistic all of your paintings will take on that feel. Whether you're painting portraits, or still lifes, landscapes, whatever. Those little things. And remember... More details does not a better painting make. I could sit and add all the details in the world to this painting, but it's not going to make it better if the foundation uh, and the masses and the values are not in place. So I, I always want to encourage people that don't, please don't think that by adding more details that your painting is going to be better and better and better. It's more about getting your beginning stages correct. And that is something that I really hound on, especially in my workshops, is um, my Still Life workshop coming up. It's a four-session Still Life. We're going to do four separate Still Lifes, all with the purpose of starting, starting, starting. If you don't get the start right, nothing else, you don't, you don't have anything else to build on. So again, I'm working now on this cedar branch as it comes around into the warm light. And just to develop a little bit more information in the cedar in the light and let the rest slip into shadow. Um, it can look intimidating to grab a big branch full of teeny little nodules and think, um, oh yeah, I'll paint that. But when you put it in this context, you realize you don't have to paint all that detail. You need a little bit and the brain fills in the rest. Um, so I'm going through now and adding the shadows under the branch and under the pomegranate uh, to cre create more of that sense of weight by adding that sharp anchor underneath certain objects, like the weight of the pomegranate, the gentle weight of the cedar branch, it will have more that sense of mass and solidity. So I'm painting the little shadows for the pomegranate berries as they are on the table surface. And to paint these little berries, they are just a little bit of the alizarin crimson and cadmium red. And I just indicate each berry by a red shape on top of the little dark shadow. As I'm painting them, I'm deciding again on my canvas, where is the best place to put a berry? Um, not always so much what I see in the still life, but more um, what aesthetically is pleasing on my canvas. So a little bit of um, cadmium red, a little more cadmium red into those, uh, the red mixture, and I just get put the berries in the background. They're a little bit more um, opaque and redder than the um, alizarin berries on the table. So I just get those in um, with a little bit, little bit of a highlight, yellow ochre. I don't want the berries in the background to be really sparkly. Um, so I take some cadmium yellow and I'm gonna just pull in a little bit more information in the cedar branches. I do come back to the berries on the table, but um, while I'm just working on some of these things in the foreground, sort of working on them all at the same time, I jump around a little bit. Um, and I, I, I do this also because it helps me to get a universal sense of where I'm going with the intensity of the light. 
And so um, some of these branches, I'm just, I really want to know, okay, this one gets more information, that one a little less. I think I need a little bit more of a uh, information of the cedar way back there. So there's a little definition, but not much because I like how the um, greens look like they're just slipping into mysterious shadow. And I'm trying to be very careful in the degree to which I add information and detail to these branches. The ones that are in the background are cooler, bluer, um, just for that purpose. I don't wanna put a lot of attention back where it's not needed. And this one is a little bit, it's not the cedar, it's just a pine. And um, I'm just painting it very subtle. Okay, back to the pomegranate seeds. So I'm giving them a little bit of a shadow uh, because as I put that red down, some of those shadows got a little bit lost. And I like to do it at this point. The first shadow, and then I paint the red on, that first shadow indicates where things are going to go. But as I paint them, I re-put them back in, I'm able to take some of the red, and it looks like the light is filtering through the berry, creating a little redness into the shadow. So now I've put in the cadmium red, more of that into the alizarin to create the illusion of a transparent berry. And then where the seed has a little bit more um, presence on the berry, it's a little bit more yellow ochre and white. And then I do, for the angled berry, they look like little gemstones and garnets, I do a thin line of white, and then I come back through with a few sparkles, and I just select which of the berries are going to get a highlight. And that one right there out in front is kind of the star, and it leads you into the painting. Um, and then I do the same on the big pomegranate as well. So at this point now, I'm back to the pomegranate and refining some of the information. I have to be careful that I don't make the shadows in the highlight too dark, as well as the highlights in the shadow. I don't want those too light. Otherwise, I'll lose the overall sense of value. Um, so as I stare into the highlighted areas of the pomegranate, I can see shadows and I start painting them. If I paint them too dark, it won't look like that passage is in the light and vice versa. If I'm in the shadow, working on the shadow parts of the pomegranate and I start staring at it, those highlights become really light. And if I painted them as light as I observed them, they won't hold in the shadow masses. Um, so you just have to make sure you jump around and move your eyes around and continue looking at the, it as a universal whole as much as possible. Now I'm coming through with um, some more of that alizarin and I'm refining the shapes of the berries as I see them more. And some of the berries as they get, they're in shadow and they get bounced light, they're cool blue down below. Um, and then as the shadow moves up and the pomegranate berries are more in light, they get more of the cadmium red into the lights. get that to get that effect of the light hitting the little berries some of the berries are getting a stronger light and some less I put a little um, thin down white paint on my palette knife and I'm just holding it right up to the painting and I'm taking my little tiny brush and just dabbing on in a few places I might take that and um, kind of give a little bit of an angled uh, line on some berries to make it look like a almost like a garnet angle and then um, selecting a few to really be the stars like that so pretty love those berries how clustered they are I want to encourage you to do a still life set one up at home um, and 
If you feel so inclined, pomegranates are really fun to paint. Um, I just opened it up a little bit and um, set it up. Behind my easel, I have a spotlight on uh, my setup here. Just uh, I put up a black wall behind it, and um, but you can set up a cardboard box on a table and put a spotlight directed into the box and set your objects up in there to get yourself going doing a still life. Um, but really, you know, set one up anywhere and start simple. Just do a few objects, and you, most people have things in their kitchen that are lovely. And uh, so anyway, what I'm doing here is I'm just refining the shapes of some of these as they were angled out, I felt that they didn't have quite the angle I was looking for. And um, wrapping this up. I hope that you enjoyed this still life and we'll give it a go. And be sure to check out the links below. I've got a lot of other workshops coming up. I think you're gonna enjoy what you see. And I hope to see you at one of them. All right, thanks everybody. And have a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. everybody well that wraps this up thanks so much for joining me and remember if you enjoyed this video to like and subscribe and check out the links below there's tons of information on workshops as well as my still life one coming right up all right have a wonderful christmas and i'll see you next week Bye bye